In this lecture, we're turning to chapter six of Mark Knoll's book, and we're looking at the Great Schism. Uh, now, just so you know, if you're studying specifically Roman Catholic history, there's another series of events that is often referred to as the Great Schism, and it happens when there's a schism in the papacy. So you have rival popes all claiming to be the rightful pope. Uh, but more generally speaking, when looking at the history of Christianity, the events marked by 1054 will be considered the Great Schism. So that's what we're talking about now, not the division within the papacy, but the breakup between what will come to be known as Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. So that's what we're covering now in this discussion, and it's the subject for chapter six in Knoll's book. Um, now, so this is basically the first major breakup in the history of the Christian faith. Remember that we did talk about groups that did not sign on to the Council of Chalcedon and its definition. So remember, there had been some more minor breakups within the history of Christianity, so that not all Christian churches were in perfect communion with one another by the time we're getting to the 11th century. But those earlier schisms or breakups were a little bit more minor in nature. This is going to be a major breakup and really the first major breakup in the history of the Christian tradition. We'll eventually then get to the 16th century Protestant Reformation, where we'll get the second major breakup, which will then result in a total of three major branches within Christianity. The first two are what we see coming out of this great schism. Again, the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox churches. So let's talk a little bit more about the Great Schism. And I want to begin not by looking at the events of 1054, uh, which are kind of the symbolic moments that we think of uh, as the Great Schism, but instead with some of the underlying causes that lead us to that moment in 1054, where the tensions between Christians living in the Western portion of Christianity and Christians living in the Eastern portion of Christianity have finally risen to a boil so that that breakup can occur. So let's look over on page 126 as we went, run through these causes of the Great Schism. Uh, we're going to start here in this section called East-West Division, and we're going to look at a couple of these uh, passages that I think will be helpful in order to wrap our minds around this first cause. So uh, start reading with me there in that section. In historical anticipations of the events that transpired at Constantinople in 1054, stretched back to the early history of the church. This is really important. Noel's wanting to let us know it's not like this breakup between Eastern and Western forms of Christianity comes out of nowhere. No, there actually is a lot of underlying tension that goes back to the earliest times within the Christian church. Keep reading. As early as the end of the first century, it was possible to perceive pointed differences between major representatives of what would one day be called West and East. So again, uh, Christianity is going to kind of grow in and around the Mediterranean and eventually really uh, cover most of the Roman Empire as its borders expand. So when we're talking about East and West, we have to think about it within that context. So portions of, uh, of the Western territories within the Roman Empire as it develops, and then the Eastern portions of the Roman Empire. Thus, historian Henry Bet Betenson thinks that the epistle of Clement sent from Rome to Corinth about the year 96 displays the emergence of the characteristic Roman Christianity. Here we find no ecstasies, no miraculous gifts of the Spirit, no demonology, no preoccupation with an imminent second coming. The church has settled down in the world and is going about its task soberly, discreetly, and advisedly. By the end of the second century, such Roman or Western characteristics were thoroughly matched by Greek tendencies arising from the other end of the Mediterranean. Okay, so now let's look over on page 127 at this blocked quote given to us by uh, uh, Bishop Callistos or Timothy Ware, uh, who, as Noel tells us, is an English convert to Eastern Orthodoxy. And I think we get some really good ideas here. And what you're eventually going to write into these blanks is that this first cause of the schism is represented by basic cultural, linguistic, and theological differences. 
basic cultural, linguistic, and theological differences. Linguistic having to do with language. So the idea is that there are differences in culture in the western portion of the empire versus the eastern portion of the empire. There are differences in language, right? Latin is the primary language spoken by church leaders, for example, in the western portion of Christianity in these early centuries of the faith, right? Centered, especially with the city of Rome. Greek is the language spoken in the Eastern territories of Christianity throughout the first millennium of the tradition. And the idea is that these underlying cultural and linguistic differences are going to lead to theological differences, which creates a bit of a tension because it means that there are different ways of thinking about what it means to be Christian in the Latin speaking Western portion of Christianity as there are in the Greek speaking Eastern portion of Christianity. And it's not that these tensions create, you know, heated rivalries or division or that the schism had to happen right away in the second or third century. It's just important to see that there were these differences that are going to contribute to the eventual schism that happens in the 11th century. So listen to some of the examples that uh, we get in this blocked quote on 127. From the start, Greeks and Latins had each approached the Christian mystery in their own way. So already he's highlighting the language differences. That you have Latin being spoken by church leaders and theologians in the West, Greek being spoken in the East. At the risk of some oversimplification, it can be said that the Latin approach was more practical, the Greek was more speculative. In some ways that should already make sense to us because as we think back to the Council of Nicaea and especially the Council of Chalcedon, remember that these more speculative debates are primarily happening in Eastern territories, right? Places like uh, the area around Antioch in Syria or Alexandria in Egypt, right? Yes, Leo eventually sends his tome over to help settle the debate, but in some ways you see Leo present a kind of practical solution, maybe not quite wanting to get caught up in the speculative semantic debate. Right? Again, this is somewhat of an oversimplification, as we are told here, but it gives you a sense of just the cultural differences at play within these two portions of Christian territory. Keep reading. Latin thought was influenced by juridical ideas, right, legal ideas, by the concepts of Roman law, while the Greeks understood theology in the context of worship and in the light of the holy liturgy. When thinking about the Trinity, for example, Latins or Western Christians at this time started with the unity of the Godhead. There's one God. Greeks started with the threeness of the persons. Now we know from our study of the Council of Nicaea that both of those things are true, right? There is one God, three persons. So it's not that they're contradicting each other, it's just a matter of emphasis. And when you read theologians living in the Western portion of the empire throughout the first millennium, and when they're talking about the Trinity, they're often starting first and foremost with emphasizing the oneness of God. Whereas thinkers in the East while not denying the oneness of God, of course, are starting with an emphasis on the threeness, the distinction of the persons. So again, these aren't mutually exclusive. It's a matter of, uh, of emphasis that comes as a result of some of these cultural and linguistic differences that lead to the slight theological differences of approach. Okay. Look at the next example. When reflecting on the crucifixion, Latins, thought primarily of Christ the victim, Greeks of Christ the victor. Again, both of those things are true, and neither side would have denied the other, right? Yes, Christ was the sacrificial lamb. He was the victim who died for the sake of humanity, right? But yes, he was also the victor. He was the one who was victorious over death, especially through the resurrection that followed the crucifixion, and therefore provides the victory over death and sin and evil and Satan. So neither side is going to deny those two ideas, but there is a difference in the matter of emphasis. Western theologians are primarily focused on Christ as the victim who dies as that sacrificial lamb for the sake of humanity, Eastern theologians speaking Greek, writing in Greek, are focusing more on that victorious side of the crucifixion and resurrection. 
Latins talked more of redemption, Greeks of deification. These two distinctive approaches were not in themselves contradictory. Each served to, sup to supplement the other, and each had its place in the fullness of Catholic tradition. Catholic at this time just means the universal church. So almost all churches were part of what would be called the Catholic church. Yes, you had some of those churches who broke away in some ways by not agreeing to the Chalcedonian definition. But Catholic at this time is not the Roman Catholic. Rome is just one patriarchal location within the church of the first millennium. This is the Catholic tradition, the universal church. But now that the two sides were becoming strangers to one another, with no political and little cultural unity, with no common language, there was a danger that each side would follow its own approach in isolation and push it to extremes, forgetting the value in the other point of view. Right? If we had uh, worked through uh, the chapter on Charlemagne, we would have seen that part of this division that's occurring, this lack of communication between Christians in the Western portion of the empire and Christians in the Eastern portion of the empire, is caused by the rise of Islam that is spreading from the Arabian Peninsula into what were traditionally called by Christians at that time, the Holy Lands, uh, into places like Syria and areas surrounding Jerusalem and eventually through portions of North Africa. When you see that rise of Islamic conquest, it actually cause a bit of a, causes a bit of a geographical kind of division between East and West so that it's harder to communicate. And when you have that lack of communication, what we're being told here is that it allows for the possibility of the two sides to just grow a little bit further apart in terms of their theological differences that are in some ways grounded in the linguistic and cultural differences that have caused a level of underlying tension from the very beginnings of Christianity. So again, we just don't wanna think of 1054 as coming out of nowhere. We need to see how these tensions grow through time based on different issues that lead us to that boiling point. So basic cultural, linguistic, and theological differences. Now for the second cause, we're looking at a very specific theological issue, and this is the, based on the single word, the Latin word, filioque. So if you look over on page 128 in the first full paragraph, says, over the course of time, concrete theological differences also separated the West from the East. So this isn't just a kind of general difference in terms of emphasis. These are more specific, concrete theological differences. And perhaps the most notable is this idea of the filioque. To this day, the Eastern Church remains astounded at the casualness with which the West added the word filioque to the Nicene Creed. And Noel tells us to go back to chapter eight, or, or sorry, note eight in chapter two above. So go back to page 50, where we see the Nicene Creed. And note eight actually shows up over on page 51 at the very bottom, but just look at that note eight on page 51. Noel says the Latin word filioque, which means and from the sun, or just and the sun, was a seemingly small but highly divisive later addition to the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. In 589 CE, so if you think about the creed over on page 50, first getting written in 325 and then pretty quickly beefed up in 381, we are now more than 200 years after that in 589, when at the Third Council of Toledo, the Western leaders of the Universal Catholic Church inserted filioque after the affirmation of faith in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, right? So if you look back over on page 50 and look at that longer version of the creed that was decided at the First Council of Constantinople, look at that final section. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy, the Lord, and life-giving one proceeding forth from the Father. It's at that point that 200 years later, Latin-speaking Western bishops inserted the word filioque, meaning and the son, so that as Latin-speaking churches continued after 589, when they say the creed in Latin, they are saying proceeding forth from the father and the son. Eastern bishops were not really invited and didn't really have a presence at that Council of Toledo in 589. 
So when the Western bishops make this decision at what they consider a council whose conclusion should apply to the entire church, this really angers a lot of the Eastern bishops who feel that the Western bishops are making a decision to change one of the most important creeds of the Christian faith without even consulting the Eastern bishops. So the Eastern bishops are not going to include this word, its Greek, Greek equivalent, as they then are going to continue reciting the Nicene Creed in their churches. So from 589 on, you actually don't have the same exact creed being recited in Latin-speaking churches and Greek-speaking churches. Latin-speaking churches are using that word, the fili uh, filioque, when talking about the procession of the Holy Spirit. Greek-speaking churches are not. Right? Again, we don't have to worry too much about the theology of this. It's just a question of how we talk about the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit proceed only from the Father, or is the Holy Spirit generated from the relationship between the Father and Son? Right? In some ways, some people will talk about uh, the Latin-speaking portion of the church, thinking about the Trinity as a circle, where again, you focus on the oneness rather than the distinction of the three persons. So in that case, sure, maybe you talk about how there's this interplay, and therefore the Spirit doesn't just come from the Father, but comes from the Father and the Son. In the East, if you think of the threeness of the persons more forcefully, maybe you think of the Trinity as a triangle. It's still one shape, but you more specifically note the distinct roles of the three persons. And in that case, the Father stands on top, and the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Spirit proceeds from the Father. Not from the Father and the Son, but from the Father. So again, don't worry too much about the theology. Focus on the ecclesiology, which is the nature of the church. Think about how this would anger the Eastern bishops when the fundamental creed decided at Nicaea and expanded upon at Constantinople was altered by Western bishops without your input as Eastern bishops. So that becomes a very concrete form of continued tension in the life of the overall church. If you keep reading on page 128 from where we left off, from the sixth century, when Western churches began to insert and the sun, Filioque, in the section of the creed that speaks of the Spirit's procession from the Father, the Orthodox complained that the West was violating the Spirit as well as the letter of what had transpired at Nicaea. They violated the Spirit by acting unilaterally in making the change, right? Not really including bishops from all regions of the Christian church in this decision. Uh, and they violated the letter by, uh, uh, by violating an explicit canon of the council that the wording of its formula was not to be changed, right? which was actually part of uh, those fourth century councils. Uh, moreover, the Eastern churches argued that the Western edition was a grievous theological error. In this view, the Western urge to equalize relationships among the members of the Trinity short-circuited the full personality of the Spirit and so crippled understanding of what the Spirit was to do. Again, for our purposes, don't focus so much on the theological argument there. Focus on this as another way in which tension was increasing between Christians living in the Western portion of Christianity and Christians living in the Eastern portion of Christianity. There's still unity, by and large, between the two sides, right? There are other councils where the groups are coming together. There's still some communication but you can start to see that the beginnings, or at least the furthering of that separation, which will culminate in the events of the Great Schism of 1054. Okay, look at the next paragraph for our third cause. The other theological difficulty that eventually crystallized was Eastern resentment at claims for papal supremacy. So papal having to do with the Pope. So remember that you have, after Constantine moves the capital from Rome to Constantinople, you have then five patriarchs in the Christian church, the five most important offices, the original four, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome. And then you add the bishop or patriarch of Constantinople, once that is the seat of the empire. So you have those five patriarchs. And what happens as we're getting into the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries is it seems that certain bishops of Rome, patriarchs of Rome, 
who are already being called Papa or Pope in the Latin, are starting to grab more and more power in the life of Christianity. They are seeking more control, whereas the Eastern bishops and patriarchs want there to be a sense of equality among the bishops of the church, recognizing the five most important, but also recognizing equality even among those five. Remember, four are located more in that Eastern Greek-speaking territory. Only the Patriarch of Rome is over in that Western Latin-speaking territory. Because of that, you can imagine why the popes start to maybe see themselves as more and more significant because they really do represent kind of half of the church, whereas the four Eastern patriarchs all represent the other half. So we're seeing more and more kind of desire for control coming out of Rome in these centuries leading up to 1054. Now, after the events of 1054, the Great Schism, we get this quote at the bottom of page 128 in the 12th century from an Eastern Archbishop. And listen to the way he reflects back on the way in which the Western bishops of Rome were trying to demand and take more and more power over the entire church. He says, this is the very bottom of 128, we do not deny to the Roman church the primacy amongst the five sister patriarchates. In other words, Here's an Eastern Archbishop saying, look, we believe in the five patriarchs, right, often referred to as the five sister patriarchates. The church is often thought of as the bride of Christ. So that's where you get the feminine language, right? Dealing with church offices, for example. We do not deny that the Roman bishop has primacy among the five, meaning kind of the first among equals, which is already pretty significant that the Eastern church uh, leaders were willing, at least this one, to grant that primacy to the Patriarch of Rome, the Pope. Right? But she has separated herself from us by her own deeds, when through pride she assumed a monarchy which does not belong to her office. So the third cause here that I want you to jot down is using the words from this quote, primacy, not monarchy. Right? Both of those words are in that blocked quote. Here's an Eastern Archbishop saying, we were fine giving the Pope's primacy in making decisions for the life of the universal Catholic Church. We are not okay with the Pope's acting like monarchs. We were not okay with them trying to uh, take a kind of monarchical control. We didn't want to give them monarchy. Okay. So in other words, just thinking more commonsensically, it's like the Eastern Bishop here is saying, we were okay with the popes having the loudest voice in the church, but we are not okay with the popes acting like they had the only voice in the church. So this issue of the role of the popes and the way in which decisions were supposed to be made within the larger church becomes that third cause that really brings that tension to a boiling point. Continue with his quote over on the bottom of page 129. How shall we accept decrees from her, the Roman church, the Roman bishop, that have been issued without consulting us and even without our knowledge? Pretty clearly here, think back to the Filioque in the sixth century, right? Here we are 600 years later, and this archbishop is probably thinking of the Fili Filioque, right? How can we let the Pope and the Western church make decisions without even consulting us. We're okay granting the Pope's primacy, but not monarchy. We still need to be invited to the table to have these discussions. If the Roman pontiff, the Pope, seated on the lofty throne of his glory, wishes to thunder at us, and if he wishes to judge us and even to rule us in our churches, and we'll see more about that in a second, not by taking counsel with us, but at his own arbitrary pleasure, what kind of brotherhood or even what kind of parenthood can this be? In other words, you have the Eastern Archbishop saying, look, there's supposed to be a brotherhood among the bishops, especially among the five patriarchs. We'd even maybe be okay with a kind of parenthood where we grant the Pope primacy, but still the others are brought in for discussions and their voices matter, right? He goes on and says, no, we should be the slaves, not the sons of such a church. And the Roman see, the office of the Pope, would not be the pious mother of sons, but a hard and imperious mistress of slaves. 
So you have this Eastern Archbishop looking back on the way things continue to develop prior to the Great Schism, and he says, look, the Roman bishops, the popes, were demanding so much control and power over, over the life of the church that they were leading to the breakup that had to happen if there wasn't going to be a greater sense of equality among the patriarchs and other bishops in Christianity. So those are the causes that are leading us to these events of 1054. So let's go back and look at these events just a little bit on pages, uh, the opening pages of the chapter, uh, 122 and over to 123. So look on page 123 in the second paragraph. Uh, and we're not going to have to worry about all the little details here, but I still want to re reinforce the kind of overall picture of what's going on in these years leading up to 1054. Tangled political ecclesiastical strife precipitated the crisis. So political and then ecclesiastical. Remember, that has to do with the church. So issues between leaders of the various um, kind of individual churches or areas within the universal church. Emperor Henry III, over in the western portion, at this time we actually have two kind of different emperors ruling over sort of this large still Roman uh, empire, even though it's sort of divided into a Roman and Byzantine empire. Pope Leo IX and the eastern or Byzantine emperor Constantine IX had entered negotiations in order to make common cause against Norman knights who were invading southern Italy and threatening property and authority belonging to all three. There's a lot of groups coming, especially from Northern Europe uh, during these time periods, invading, especially Italy. And all of these major uh, figures, including the Eastern Emperor, still maintained control over different portions of what we call Italy. Part of the agreement they reached to unite and resist the Normans was the stipulation that the Pope regain authority over the few Greek churches in Italy and that the Byzantine emperor persuade the Eastern patriarch, Michael Serralarius, to forward Leo a synodical letter of the sort that had traditionally been sent to Rome after the election of a new patriarch, but which Serralarius had not done. So you can already see there was a lot of tension, right? The patriarch of Constantinople, the most important of the patriarchs in the Greek speaking portion of the church, hadn't even welcomed the new Pope into being a member of uh, the patriarchs. Uh, so there was already tension, you know, stewing from these earlier causes. And then you also have the Pope trying to have control over these Greek churches that exist in Italy. So in other words, you do still have some migration of people back and forth. So you have these Greek-speaking communities over in the West that want to worship in the way that is typical in the Eastern Greek-speaking territory. You also have Latin speaking Christians over in the East who have moved. They wanna worship the way they always used to worship over in the Western portion, even though they're living in the opposite territory. Okay? The patriarch was in no mood to comply. Rather, he reciprocated against the Western takeover of the Greek churches in Italy by demanding that Latin churches in Constantinople conform to Greek rites. And you can see some of the examples, right? What kind of bread is used in the Eucharist when you're supposed to fast. So now you have both leaders, the Pope in Rome and the Patriarch of Constantinople over in the East saying, if you are a church in my territory, in my region, you have to conform to my version of Christian worship, even if you're a Greek-speaking Christian in Rome or a Latin-speaking Christian over in Constantinople. So you can see some of the tension as the two religious leaders are trying to um, take more and more control and not ceding control to the other. And then you have the political leaders kind of over above them or alongside of them also having their share of tension, okay? Uh, when the Latin church is refused, the Patriarch of Constantinople actually shut them down. So there's a little bit of the backdrop. Now go over to page 124. The event that propelled degenerating ill will into schism was Pope Leo's capture by Norman troops later in 1053. Recognizing how greatly imperiled even the Byzantine or Eastern property was in Italy, remember they still owned some property even though it was in Italy, the Eastern emperor persuaded that Constant, uh, uh, Constantinople uh, patriarch, Serralarius, to join him in dispatching more conciliatory missives to the Pope. So the Eastern side 
is eventually going to say, look, we need to get along. We have some other groups that are threatening all of us, whether from the north, maybe the Muslim conquest from the south. We need to all get on the same page and get past our differences. In response, Leo sends a three-man uh, kind of legation, a, a group of delegates over to the east. And it's a little bit uncertain exactly what Leo had in mind when sending them over there. But by the time they're there, we see that the Pope has died and the Cardinal who was in charge of this delegation definitely wanted to exert the authority of the bishops of Rome when confronting the Eastern Patriarch of Constantinople. So if you look at that next uh, paragraph, uh, second sentence, not daunted, uh, this cardinal thrust a stiff papal letter that he had himself written onto Serularius, the, art, uh, the patriarch of Constantinople. That letter reminded the patriarch in no uncertain terms that as a hinge remaining unmoved opens and shuts a door, so Peter, believed to be kind of the first bishop of Rome by uh, Christians at that time, and his successors at Rome, have an unfettered jurisdiction over the whole church. Since no one ought to interfere with their position because the highest see or office, the Bishop of Rome, is judged by none. Right? So this certainly isn't trying to ease the tension. Right? Now this letter being thrust on to the Patriarch of Constantinople, written by this Cardinal, the Pope is now dead, says, look, the Popes of Rome are in control of everything just as a door cannot move an inch except under the guide of the hinges. So nothing can happen in the church except under the direct control of the bishops of Rome, the popes. Okay. So here you have that demand for a kind of monarchy over the life of the church coming from this cardinal representing the papacy. Okay. Keep reading. Serularius responded in kind by rejecting the letter, obviously. And by questioning whether now, since the Pope was dead, the Cardinal was even a properly credentialed legate, right, a representative. The Cardinal was offended, resolved to leave Constantinople at once, but before he did, he entered the great church of Hagia Sophia, holy wisdom, placed on the altar a bull, which is a piece of paper, excommunicating Serularius, shook the dust off his feet and, uh, and left. It is reported that an Eastern deacon hastened after the Cardinal, trying to return that bull, but the overture was rebuffed, whereupon the paper was dropped in the street. Soon thereafter, Serularius excommunicated those representatives from the now dead Pope. So what you end up having in 1054, and again, don't worry too much about all the details about trying to control the worship of the different churches in their territories. Focus on this idea that at the end of the day, you have a mutual excommunication. Okay? The cardinal writes this letter, puts it on the altar of the primary church in Constantinople, saying that the patriarch of Constantinople, okay, the most important of those four Eastern Greek-speaking patriarchs, is excommunicated from the Church of Christ. It's a pretty big move, right? And in response, that patriarch says, you're excommunicating me. No, I excommunicate you from the true church of Christ. Right? So ultimately, only a handful of people are excommunicated by each side. But in effect, what this does is basically separate those who are going to remain loyal to the popes in Rome, on the one hand, versus those who are going to be loyal to the patriarch of Constantinople and the other eastern patriarchs, on the other hand. So it's not like the entire, you know, churches are excommunicated from each other, but these mutual excommunications do, in effect, create this radical division, right? Because if Serularius, the patriarch of Constantinople, is not considered part of the church um, led by the Pope in Rome, then all those Greek-speaking Christians who are going to be loyal to the patriarch of Constantinople are going to really, in some effect, consider themselves not affiliated or in communion with the church represented by the Pope and vice versa. So it's this mutual excommunication that really seals this uh, or, or creates this kind of ultimate schism between the two groups, right? Even though the tension had been going back for centuries upon centuries, right? 
while at this point we're not yet using this language, we're still thinking more of the Latin church and the Greek church. As time continues, we're going to see these two churches kind of come up with their own kind of ways of thinking about themselves. So we will have Roman Catholicism representing those who are in communion with the popes, right? At this time, primarily those Western Latin speaking churches and Christians who go to them. And then you have Eastern Orthodoxy or Eastern Orthodox churches representing those Greek speaking Christians uh, and the churches that are in communion with the Eastern patriarchs. Okay? So at this point, that means that the two really aren't communicating with each other necessarily all that much, and that you do have this radical division, okay? This doesn't mean that there is no hope for reconciliation, because what Noel tells us is that as we move into the, third, the 14th and 15th centuries, we start to have a series of what are called reunion councils. In other words, maybe it takes a few hundred years, but some cooler heads start to prevail, and there's an effort to try to reunite the Latin-speaking and Greek-speaking churches into, once again, the universal or Catholic church. Okay? He describes these efforts over on page 125, uh, right where we left off, and says the final reunion council happens in Florence, Italy, in 1438 and 1439. So again, we are... Uh, almost 400 years after the Great Schism of 1054. And look what he says about, you know, a little more than halfway through that first full paragraph. He says, after intense debate for several months in 1438 and 1439, all but one member of the large Eastern delegation agreed to the formula designed to heal the schism. So when you read that, you should say, oh, well, then the schism is over, right? If the Western bishops sign on to this agreement and all but one of the Eastern bishops sign on, then the schism is healed. There's now only really the one universal church and those minor, um, smaller churches that didn't agree to the Council of Chalcedon. But by and large, we're back to the one church. But then look at the next sentence. But once again, overwhelming resistance in the Eastern churches rose against the terms of agreement. It's always really fascinating, right? As scholars, we should be thinking, wait a minute, why would the average Eastern Christians reject something that their leaders agreed to at these various reunion councils, right? You would think that if the leaders could come to an agreement, then the average Christians would be fine with that. So what is it that causes the kind of average Eastern Christian upheaval or uprising against these agreements reached at the reunion councils? And Noel tells us that more and more scholars are pointing to the Fourth Crusade as that thing which really sealed the schism in the minds of average Eastern Christians, so that even when their leaders come to agreements, Eastern Christians were not willing to sign on to them, right? So what happened in that Fourth uh, Crusade? For that, look over on uh, uh, page uh, 130, 131, 132, that's where you get the discussion of the Crusades especially we're looking at page 132. So the Crusades, generally speaking, were about Western soldiers being sent by the Pope and the Western Emperor over to Eastern portions of Christianity in order to help the Eastern uh, Empire and Church fight off Muslim conquest. So that was the general kind of purpose behind the Crusades. But a lot of other things are happening. Maybe some of you have had the chance to study the Crusades in history classes, for example. But look over on 132. There are a couple of blocked quotes here that I want you to kind of read over again. Um, you know, pause this and read through them again. We're not going to read through them in their entirety, but, but do that because they're written so well. What happens in the Fourth Crusade in 1204, so that's, what, 100, 150 years after the Great Schism of 1054, is that at that moment, the Western Crusaders find themselves in Constantinople. And instead of really remaining focused on fighting the Muslim armies, they actually take over the city of Constantinople and try to establish their own control over that Eastern or Byzantine empire in the Eastern portion of Christianity. And these historians, if you read these quotes again, describe what happened during these days when they are taking over this territory. There is murder, there is rape, um, things are destroyed. The scene in Constantinople in the, at this time in 1204 is just brutal, 
right? It is, a, it is described here as a brutal pillaging of this city. Remember Constantinople has come to be seen by Eastern Christians as the heart of Eastern Christianity. So when the Western Crusaders, the soldiers are doing this, right? Again, they're not doing it to the supposed enemy of the Crusades, they're doing it to fellow Christians. Right? And immediately after these events, the Pope even sent a letter apologizing for the actions of these Crusaders. But the damage had been done. It would take a little while for the Eastern uh, kind of empire, empire to regain control over this territory, but the damage had been done. The scars had been created. That happens in 1204. So that means even another 225 years later, in 1439, 235 years later, this is why Eastern Christians still don't want to reconcile with the Western church because they hold the Western church responsible for the pillaging of Constantinople in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade. So for Noel and other historians, they say that's why no matter how well the Eastern bishops could reach an agreement with Western leaders, Eastern Christians on the ground rejected any effort to reconcile with a church that they held responsible for the pillaging of Constantinople, the heart of Eastern Christianity in 1204. Right? Again, pause this, read those little passages again um, uh, over on, what was it, page 132, one, uh, I believe, um, just to get a sense of what those events were and what they led to, right? If you look at the very end of that second quote on 132, um, that's where the historian tells us it's really with the sacking of Constantinople in 1204 that the Western and Eastern Christian schism was complete, irremediable, and final, okay? Now, even after that, it doesn't mean that there weren't any efforts for unity, but they're pretty well silenced after 1439, and especially after 1453, when Constantinople falls to the Muslim conquest. That's described back on 125, where Constantine the Ninth is still, in 1453, another, what, 14 years after Florence, is trying to promote East-West reconciliation, primarily as a way to fight off the Muslim conquest. And it says, when the Turks attacked Constantinople in 1453, the crisis brought all Christians in the city together. Early in the morning on May 29th, Constantine attended a united service for Orthodox and Catholics in the Hagia Sophia. So everybody who was in Constantinople at that point, Greek-speaking Christians who were loyal to the Eastern patriarchs, Latin-speaking Christians loyal to the Pope, they all came together that morning to pray together, to hope that they could resist the Muslim conquest of the city. Then he went out to battle where he met his death. The same day, the Turks captured the city and transformed Hagia Sophia into a mosque, which is what you see in the picture back on 124. That church that had been the center of Christianity in Constantinople turned into a mosque, uh, uh, which it then served for uh, Muslims uh, for centuries upon centuries to this day. Right? Uh, with Emperor Constantine the, the 11th died not only the Byzantine Empire, but also the last serious effort to repair the Great Schism, that is, until the 1960s. So in other words, after Florence, and especially after the fall of Constantinople, which is today referred to as Istanbul, Turkey, um, because of the takeover by the Muslim conquest at that time, um, after that, those events, there is basically no real effort for reconciliation or even increased cooperation until the 1960s, so just within the last century. And there are a couple of interesting things that help to encourage this new communication between the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox churches beginning around the 1960s. The first thing is the Second Vatican Council, Vatican II. This is a council of the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, once the churches are divided, councils are not going to have individuals from both sides. Yeah, that kind of happened in these reunion councils, but after hopes of reconciliation are over, a council called by the Pope is going to be attended by only Roman Catholic leaders, and there will be other councils attended by Eastern bishops because these two great churches are now separated from one another. So Vatican II is a Roman Catholic council, and Vatican II does a lot of things, but one of the things that it does is it tries to heal some of the divisions that are present between the Roman Catholic Church and other groups. 
So there are apologies to Jews for the centuries of uh, persecution that the Jews experienced under uh, Roman Catholic control of territories. There are apologies to Muslims for some of the events happening during the Crusades. But notably, there's also an effort to open up lines of communication with Eastern Orthodox leaders, right? You actually see this toward the end of the chapter on page 139, where they actually issued a joint statement with the Roman Catholic Church leaders and the Eastern Orthodox Church leaders. And I want you to read through those various points of this statement, but note that the two sides come together and they acknowledge that mistakes were made, both leading up to 1054, but especially in those events of 1054. They actually rescind or take back those excommunications that were announced in 1054. Right? Officially speaking, therefore, that a uh, list of people who have been excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, which is a list that exists and you can find all the people who have been excommunicated, no longer includes Patriarch Serularius, the Eastern Patriarch of Constantinople in 1054. It was erased. And similarly, the list of people excommunicated from the Eastern Orthodox Churches no longer includes those delegates from Rome in 1054. So you can read those three points again and see the effort to try to acknowledge that mistakes were made. And while this doesn't mean the two groups are going to get together and that there will once again be perfect unity between these two branches of Christianity, it does mean that there will be more communication, more cooperation going forward. The second thing that really helps this renewed communication is the reign of Pope John Paul II. He was a pope, uh, kind of during the 70s and 80s, that time period, he reigned for a long time. And one of the things that was really interesting is that he was originally from Poland, which is kind of an Eastern European country that we would consider it, right? So that means that as he grew up, he was Roman Catholic, of course, his entire life, but he would have grown up around a lot of Eastern Orthodox Christians, right? Members of uh, the Polish Orthodox Church. Right? That experience allowed him to kind of have a unique role where he could possibly create more bridges between the Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodoxy. And there were a couple of very interesting symbolic moments that occurred during the reign of Pope John Paul II. So for example, and Noel mentions both of these, at one point he invites the Patriarch of Constantinople, even though Constantinople is Istanbul on maps today, there is still a Patriarch of Constantinople that is still the title for that office of leadership in Eastern Orthodoxy. He invited that patriarch to give a sermon at a mass that the Pope was celebrating. That's a big deal, right? Saying, look, we're, we're not so divided that we have such extreme differences that, that the leader of, of this community can't give a sermon at a Roman Catholic mass. Later on, Pope John Paul II actually stood together with a patriarch of Constantinople, it was a different one at this point, and they stood together shoulder to shoulder and recited the Nicene Creed together. And of course, everybody wondered what's going to happen when they get to the Filioque. Pope John Paul II had recited the Filioque at every moment of his life when he recited the Nicene Creed, thousands upon thousands of times. The Patriarch of Constantinople had never recited the Filioque or its Greek equivalent ever in his life. So what was going to happen? Well, Pope John Paul II recited the Creed and left out the filioque as a sign that that word should not separate these two leaders and the churches that they represent. It was a sign of humility from Pope John Paul II. He agrees with the filioque, but he was willing to recite the creed in the same exact way that it was recited by the Patriarch of Constantinople. So they could show that what unites Catholics and Eastern Orthodox far outweighs what divides them, okay? So that gives you a good sense of, uh, of the schism and the events that come after the schism. The last thing I want to mention is that Roman Catholicism maintains a little bit more uh, uh, unity within itself or unanimity within its understanding of worship than Eastern Orthodoxy. For example, we generally refer to the Roman Catholic Church. If you're in Cedar Rapids and you go to a Catholic church, it's a Roman Catholic Church. Right? Eastern Orthodoxy as it developed, allowed a little bit more autonomy or independence along national lines. 
So with Eastern Orthodoxy, we often think of the Greek Orthodox Church or the Russian Orthodox Church or the Syrian Orthodox Church. In other words, while there is still unity among the various Orthodox churches in Eastern Orthodoxy, there's a little bit more autonomy, which is why we often refer to Eastern Orthodox churches, whereas we often talk only about the Roman Catholic Church because of the greater sense of uh, unanimity within Roman Catholicism. So for example, in Cedar Rapids, uh, there are two, I believe, Eastern Orthodox churches. Um, and if you went to their website, you would see whether they are Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, etc. Usually tied to a particular location in the historic Eastern portion of Christianity during the first millennium of Christianity. But then those churches, of course, will travel around the world as you have immigration and you will have those communities existing in all parts of the world uh, to this day. Now in this class, we will look at a few uh, writings from Eastern Orthodox figures when we get to the McGrath volume, but for the rest of our discussion of church history in the Mark Knoll book, we'll be focused more on the Western portion of Christianity, Roman Catholicism, and then how it faces another major breakup in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation. So we'll be turning to those, uh, uh, that event and everything that happens along with it uh, shortly. But I hope that this gives you a good sense of what's going on with the schism. Really make sure that you can describe carefully and in complete sentences the causes. Make sure you can mention briefly the mutual excommunication of 1054. And then make sure you can remember the significance of the reunion councils, why we believe that they were rejected by Eastern Christians on the ground, even 235 years after the Fourth Crusade, and then make sure you're at least somewhat aware of the importance of the fall of Constantinople and kind of really creating now 500 years of silence between the two sides and the way in which Vatican II and Pope John Paul II helped to open up some of those lines of communication.